We ask the question. What is needed in the world? In the ferocious battle for an online audience, one man stands out as a somewhat unlikely star, Sir Ken Robinson. Millions and millions of people watch his talks here. And what is he talking about? It actually costs an enormous amount to mop up the damage from the dropout crisis. This man is obsessed with education and how it's impacting societies around the world. And his ideas are resonating in all kinds of cultures and among all kinds of audiences. And why is this man such a hit? We'll try to find out in Doha, where Sir Ken stopped by on his global campaign for nothing less than a better future. Sir Ken, thank you for talking to Al Jazeera. Now, you hold that the, the very way that we teach our children stifles their creativity. Can you lay that out a little bit more for us? Well, I don't, I'm not saying that that's true in every school of every teacher. Uh, I'm, my, I don't speak in criticism of teachers or schools in general, but there are features of the political culture for education that I think are um, uh, they're inimical to the sorts of education our kids really need. I think our, all our children are born with immense talents, that we need forms of education which cultivate them, identify them, uh, which energize them, which engage them in education, and too often that's not the case. And one of the reasons is that uh, policies for education are often these days very focused on uh, testing and standardizing and and on a narrow form of curriculum. So, al although I'm not holding teachers and schools responsible for it, I think, generally speaking, we need more creative forms of education which really speak to our kids' individual right. abilities. And, and you talk of this kind of hierarchy of subjects that, that perhaps too much focus is put on science and, and not enough on the arts. Well, again, I'm not knocking science. On the contrary, I mean, science is really important. Uh, to be taught in schools and so is maths but so are the arts yeah uh, I'm not arguing against those disciplines I'm arguing for the equal place of the arts I'd also say you know I'm not trying to uh, equate creativity with the arts you can be tremendously creative in science and maths too uh, I'm arguing for a different balance of education and a different type of dynamic in schools but so in what way are, are kids missing out then if they if they if they're getting the science education that they need, but they're not getting enough in the arts arena, what are they missing out on? Well, we need to go back a step here. The, um, one of the questions I, I'm keen to ask, you know, I have a new book out called Creative Schools, which is not a theoretical book. I mean, there are theories in it, rather good ones, I feel. But, <laughs> But it's not a book of theory, it's a book of practice, you know, about which we can theorize. But it's arguing for a different style of education. And the reason for it is that our kids are living in a world of immense changes, uh, of growing complexity, of growing interconnection. And it, we therefore have to ask ourselves, what sort of education do our children need to flourish in this world? The current systems of education we've got in most countries were developed pretty much in the 19th century. I mean, systems of mass education that everybody has to go through, uh, funded by taxation. Uh, the sort of education I went through and that probably you went through, where you start at the age of five, if not a bit before, and you pop out the far end at the age of 18, you may go to college, probably do. These systems of mass education were developed for the most part in the 19th century to meet the needs of the Industrial Revolution. And my view of it is that, in many respects, they are modelled on principles of factory production. Like, for example, we, we educate our kids in batches by age, you know, all the three-year-olds, all the four-year-olds, shunting through the system. There's no educational reason to do that. It's an efficiency idea. We but, but surely there is a reason, isn't there, in the sense that, that you know, you, uh, uh, the three-year-old batch will only have learnt so much and they won't be able to keep up with the four-year-old batch if they were in with them. Well, we don't do it anywhere except in schools. And I'm, I'm not suggesting uh, you know, that we 
put all the three-year-olds in with all the 25-year-olds and let them sort it out. What I'm arguing for is that a, a more natural mode of learning is for people to learn across ages, to be mixed together more, to learn from each other. And there are perfectly respectable and long-established models for doing that, by the way. The Montessori, for example, is uh, a method of, school, of education schooling that's practiced in many parts of the world where kids aren't put rigidly into these single age groups. You know, I mean, you're a parent. You know, something, it isn't that something magical happens on a child's fourth birthday where they become a different type of being from what they were the year before. It's a gradual organic process. And there are many four-year-olds, five-year-olds who are doing remarkable things that some eight-year-olds may not be doing according to their interests and their talents. So I'm, I'm, I'm saying that these systems aren't designed to mold themselves around individual differences. They're based largely on conformity and efficiency. <coughs> and another, another thing that we do in schools often, in high schools, is divide the day into 40-minute bits and pieces. And, and you know, we do French for 40 minutes, then we do maths for 40 minutes. This isn't the best way to get kids interested or to give them the depth of study they need. Right. So there are, there are patterns of schooling which I think get in the way of effective learning. And what I'm arguing for is to reshape schools around the better ways in which people really learn. And, and more parity between, say, the science and the arts, that, that you, would, you would give a, a pupil a chance to have as much, give as much attention to maths as, say, dance. Yes, yeah. I'll tell you why. I mean, we were talking just before we came on camera. You have two children, mm -hmm. uh, twins. Right. Uh, I'll make you a bet. I don't know them. <laughs> <laughs> but, but I bet you they're completely different from each other. Yes. Yeah, that's right. They are. Totally. They are. Yeah. totally. Yeah. And they're twins. Yeah. Uh, because kids are. Even identical twins turn out to be very different from each other. I mean, not similar in some respects, but different. They have different talents. As they grow, you'll find they have different interests. They'll overlap. They'll still be twins. But they will show all sorts of individual propensities that are unique to them. So you say, well, what, so what do we want our education systems to do? Well, you want for your children what I want for mine. You want them, I imagine, to be economically independent at some point. You want them to live lives that are fulfilling and of interest to them, to be happy and to be productive citizens. That would all be good. Well, to do that, you, you need a style of education which helps them to understand the world around them, but also what's inside them, their own talents and interests. And to do that, you need a broad curriculum in schools. You, of course you need sciences, but you need them to be able to express themselves in writing, in all the other forms that the arts make available. You want them to be able to study cultures around them. So <clears throat> the problem at the moment is we have a culture that's rooted in a narrow form of testing and it's also narrowing the curriculum on the basis of, of what are thought to be more useful subjects. Well, science is very useful to all of us, but some kids really love science and they'll become scientists. Other kids will find they have some other path they want to take. And so I'm arguing for a differentiated curriculum over time that moulds itself around real talents and doesn't treat everybody as if one size fits everybody, because it simply doesn't. How do you think this, the lack of creative thinking manifests itself in the world we live in? I mean, if you look around here, you may not like it, but there's, there's a work of art right there that is creativity. If you look at the cities around in the Western world, you'll see that music, that culture, not only the Western world, music, culture and the arts is, is thriving. It would seem that creativity is existing and, and is thriving. Mm -hmm. Well, um, it is in many areas. And I should say, by the way, Nick, I'm not, I'm not saying that uh, all forms of current schooling are bad for everybody. On the contrary, I mean, I, I went through the public education system and I wouldn't be doing now what I do do if I hadn't. It, it sort of worked for me. But I know all kinds of kids for whom it doesn't work. I mean, I live in America currently, and one estimate is that something like 25% of kids don't graduate high school. They, you know, kids who start the ninth grade leave before graduating the 12th grade. I'm, I'm, I'm avoiding the word dropout. They're called dropouts in America. I don't like the word dropout because it sounds like they failed school. And I think it'd be more appropriate to say that the system failed them. Now, if you're running a business and, and you lost 25% of your customers every year, now if Al Jazeera lost 25% of its viewers every year, you might wonder whether it was you or them. You know, <laughs> that was the problem. Right, right. Uh, and you, th you try and fix that. Kids like to learn. 
but we, often we don't have systems that enable them to learn the right way. So yes, some people get through it. Uh, many people go on to very interesting lives in spite of their education. So yes, there's all this evidence here. But you think, well, how much more might there be if we cultivated these things deliberately rather than uh, people achieving them against the right. grain? And there are those that, that slip through the net. You have this great story about, about the Beatles having met Sir Paul McCartney. Yes. Um, well, I, I did a book called The Element a few years ago. And I interviewed lots of people for it about how they got to do what they do. My experience of it is that you know, there are people who, uh, quite a lot of people who don't enjoy what they do, they don't enjoy the work they do, they don't even enjoy their lives terribly much, they just get through the week and wait for the weekend. And it's not just me saying that, incidentally. The World Health uh, Organization estimates that by 2020, the second largest cause of illness among human populations and disability will be depression. That's an extraordinary state of affairs, isn't it? As the world seems to be getting materially better off, levels of depression in materially wealthy societies are increasing. Um, so a lot of people don't engage with what they're doing very much. But I also meet people who absolutely love what they do. I imagine you're one of them. You know, that, you, know you think, well, I, what else would I do? This isn't what I do, it's who I am. Meeting people like you. Well, exactly. I mean, how, how much better could it possibly <laughs> get? You know, hey, you are being paid to meet me. I mean, come on, <laughs> really. You know, so, <laughs> so um, you know, there are, th it's a common enough phrase we use, isn't it, that they're in their element. And, right. and you say to them, you know, wh why don't you do something else? And you'd say, well, this is who I am. I yeah. But I brought up Paul McCartney because, because he could have slipped through the net, couldn't he? Well, he almost did. And, and uh, yeah, I mean, I, I interviewed him for the book. I'm from Liverpool, and so is he. And he went to school across the city centre from me. I mean, I, I didn't know him then. Um, but I was a big fan of the Beatles growing up. But I interviewed him for the book because his old school now is a school for performing arts in Liverpool. It's a brilliant place called the Liverpool Institute for Performing Arts, and he's the patron. So I said to him, I asked him if he enjoyed music at school. And he said he didn't. He didn't enjoy it at all. And uh, it was a kind of rather dry program of playing classical records. The kids sat there taking not much interest in it. And I said, did your music teacher think you had any talent musically? And he said, no. Well, he does, doesn't he? <laughs> then, and then uh, I, uh, one of the other kids in the same music program, two years behind him, younger, was George Harrison, you know, the lead guitarist of the Beatles. And I said, did your music teacher think George had any talent? He said, no, not really. So I said, <laughs> I said would, would this be a reasonable thing to say then, that there was this one music teacher in Liverpool in the late 1950s who had half the Beatles in his class, and he missed it. And he said, that's right. Well, it's a bit of an oversight. That's what I'm saying. Just it's a, a tad, bit of an oversight. Yeah. Yeah. You know, Elvis Presley, I don't know if ever appealed to you. My wife is a big Elvis fan. And yeah, yeah, yeah. I amazing. like a couple. Fantastic guy. Elvis Presley went to school in Tupelo, Mississippi. And we're told he wasn't allowed in the glee club at school. And they said he would ruin their sound. Elvis. Well, we all know what great heights the glee club went on to. Once they went to keep Elvis out of the picture. And what happened to Elvis, yeah. <laughs> yeah. But you can multiply these things. I mean, people, um, you know, like, uh, uh, I don't know, architects, uh, uh, people in all work, forms of life, uh, business leaders, Richard Branson, plenty of people who have become very well known, who didn't do well at school, who did well almost in spite of it and couldn't wait to get out of it. Mm. Now, I'm not saying you have to become a celebrity to be in your element, but what I'm saying is that, that people lead better lives for themselves and the people around them if they discover their talents and the things they love to do. Mm. It's up to parents as well, though, isn't it? Up, it, it? You need good parenting too, don't you? There, there's responsibility, serious responsibility there, oh, yeah, ultimate yeah. responsibility there. Yeah, well, ideally, that's right, that's right. And I'm, I, th I think one of the challenges that kids face these days is, is, is that our conception of the nuclear family, certainly that I grew up with, is, uh, is changing very rapidly. In America, fewer than half uh, teenagers in schools come from that sort of family. You know, there are, so it's often a trick to know quite who the parents are. I mean, sometimes, uh, there may be multiple siblings with different parents or you know, different parents, different mothers or different fathers. Um, there are all kinds of new formulations of families, but either way, I have a chapter in the book about the importance of parenting, and you're quite right. Parents have a huge influence over their kids. They present role models, I mean, moral uh, uh, rules to them as well. So understanding that what you've taken on as a parent and, and not kind of drifting into it is immensely important. 
at the same time, the, as it sometimes been said, you know, your biography is not your destiny. There are all kinds of ways in which you can create and recreate your life as, as you go forward. A lot of it's to do though with discovering what you have inside you, what your own talents and interests right. are. And I'm interested to know how you discovered what was inside you. And if we spin back to, I think, age of four, you contracted polio. How do you think that impacted the, the way you ended up being the person that you are? Because you went to a, a very different school because of that. I did, yeah. Um, it's hard to know, really. Well, firstly, yes. I mean, the, the, I, I was brought up in a large working class family in Liverpool. Uh, we're a very close family, still are. They're wonderful. I love the bones of them. Uh, and it's an extended family. You know, my mum had um, six siblings. I've got six. You know, and so we had a corresponding number of cousins. And you know, they're all over right. the place, really. Uh, but yes, this is Liverpool in the 50s. And my dad... There was a big Everton fan, a big soccer fan, and he uh, thought that I was going to be the soccer player in the family. Apparently I was very strong as a kid and uh, very swift and fit and able and had good kind of ball control and all of that. And, and he was convinced I was going to be the Evertonian in the family. And then, yes, there were these polio epidemics in the early 50s and I got it. So I went overnight you know from being this fit four-year-old to being in bed paralyzed and I was in hospital for about eight months I came out as on two braces and crutches and I was tremendously cute I have to say I mean really I was, <laughs> people sponta sure. spontaneously gave me money in the street I mean it was rather lucrative for my brother anyway but, <laughs> but um, my dad and mum they, they were just very clear about it that therefore you know, it I, I was not going to make a living through manual work, so I had to get focused on my education. And yes, I went to I went to special ed at the age of five, a school. They weren't very good at euphemisms in Liverpool in the 1950s. I went to a school for the physically handicapped. And uh, I was surrounded by kids with all sorts of disabilities. But I had some teachers there who spotted something in me. There was a, a wonderful man called Charles Strafford who was the local inspector for special needs. I didn't know that when he came into the classroom, but he spotted something in me and spoke to the head teacher and I was moved up a class and then I was given coaching for the 11 plus, which is the big selection exam in England at the time. I passed it. I was, I think, the first one in the school to pass it and went to the local grammar school. So I was then into public education. So, there's so, so is it possible to say that, that contracting polio may have actually shaped who you are today? The, oh, there's no question about it. Because, because the, uh, that particular teacher, I mean, he, he certainly turned your life around, didn't he? Oh, there's no question. Absolutely no question about it. Uh, lots of influences. In my, my parents made me focus on my education, which I didn't want to do. This was Liverpool in the early 1960s. You know, the Mersey sound was booming all around us. My brother was in a band rehearsing in the front room and I was at the back doing Latin irregular verbs. I mean, I didn't want to do it. <laughs> and my house was hysterical all the time. You know, there was just a constant flow of people having a good time. So, yeah, I mean, I had to get very focused on it. But they pushed me hard for it. And there were various teachers along the way. But, yeah, if I hadn't got polio, you know, I'd, I would have... My ambition probably in due course would have been to go as a professional soccer player. But, but what happened... And my brother became a professional soccer player. Right, OK. But what happened during your education that, that made you think creatively about creative thinking a well, and, and the, the need for it and, and how it's missing in education around Well, I the suppose world. a couple of things, really. Well, one is that, um, that I enjoyed my own education, but there were certain, certain things I, was, I wanted to get to and we didn't. I mean, for example, uh, we, we studied plays in English, but we read them. You know, as if they were literature rather than as scripts to be performed. So they reached a point where we asked one of the teachers if we could put a play on. Because there's a feature of grammar school education you know, that, that you read them rather than, or at least our school, read rather than performed. So we put a play on and he directed it and we loved it. I was stage manager, I was also in it. And then we did them for the next couple of years. And I think on the third run, we said to this teacher, would you direct this play? And, and he said, no, he didn't have time to direct it. He thought I should direct it. I was astonished. It never crossed my mind that I could direct a play. I didn't think I could direct a play. But everybody nodded, and I thought, well, if they think I can do it, I probably can do it. 
I suppose, I, I, I don't psychologize this too much, but I think that one of the effects of, for me, of having polio, well, first, it focused my head in a particular way I wouldn't have done otherwise. Secondly, going into special ed, and I'm only thinking about this now retrospectively, I didn't think this at the time. I was conscious that there were, I was surrounded by kids with various sorts of disabilities who were very smart and funny and had talent in all sorts of directions. But very often all the people could see was the disability. They thought that defined them and people outside of it. So they'd see somebody with cerebral palsy and think, well, that's, that, that's who that kid is. Or they were deaf, that's who that kid is. And they weren't that at all, just something they were dealing with. And my experience of it is that when I got older and got out and about in the world and got into education is that actually everybody has special needs. I don't know anybody who doesn't. You know, you've got them, we've all got them. Everyone's got something they're dealing with. You know, whether it's, I mean, I don't, I don't want to presume, you know, but, but, <laughs> but everyone's got something. Things that, you know, whether they're emotional things or psychological things or actual physical things. And the thing that you may think is the thing they're dealing with may not be the thing that worries them at all. You know, it may, it may not be that. I mean, it never bothered me. I had polio, for example. I think some people imagine that was something I was struggling with, but it didn't stop me doing anything I wanted to do. But it just got me focused in a certain sort of way. And anyway, so I, I put these plays on and, and I went to college and I studied theatre and English. And I got interested in the roles of theatre in schools and I did a PhD about all of that and and it was that that made me because I wondered why these things weren't more common in schools and in fact they used to be so it was a combination of an interest in the arts but also a recognition that all sorts of people I knew thought they weren't smart because of the way they'd been educated or hadn't discovered their talents because of the way they'd been educated so I just had this conviction and still do that everyone has a deep reservoir of talent and ability and that everyone's kind of unfinished business and if you can give them the opportunity wonderful things start to happen. One final thing in the end isn't how any child gets on down to chance the chance of the village that you were brought up brought up in the town you were brought up in the teacher that you had the choices that you made the turnings that you took isn't isn't it's just down to chance ultimately. Well th there's an element of serendipity obviously um, I mean, if you're born in a war zone, if you're born in an area of high poverty, high unemployment, your starting point is very different, clearly, than somebody who's born with a silver spoon in their mouth in the home counties. Clearly, that's true. But, as I say, you know, you know biography isn't destiny. And the world is full of people who've made extraordinary gains and had extraordinary lives from very humble beginnings. And I mean, I, I don't want to overcall this, by the way. You know, but the idea when I personally was growing up on the streets of Liverpool wearing a caliper <coughs> at the age of five, that I'd be doing what I do now is preposterous. But it turns out that that is true. You create your own life. And so, yeah, I mean, there's, I'm, I'm, I'm not putting myself up as a role model. People have had extraordinary lives, you know, far, far more so than I have. Um, where you start from is not necessarily where you end up. I mean, it, as one said, it, what matters in life is not so much what happens to you, but what you make of what happens to you. The way you see things, the way you frame it, the way you turn things to your advantage. There's a lot of research around the idea of luck. Lucky people tend to have certain characteristics. They're more outgoing. They're more willing to take a risk uh, compared to people who style themselves as unlucky, who tend to be defeatist in the face of opportunity. They take the opportunity. Some people take it and some don't. So, yes, there's serendipity. But human life is inherently creative, like your life. You've created your life and you can recreate it. And w the life you create is a function of, obviously, of circumstance, but of disposition and of talent and, and, of, and of whether or not you discover what you have inside you or you don't. And it's why education is so important, because we're all born with immense possibilities. Whether we realize them is a lot to do with how we are encouraged and how these opportunities within us are cultivated so yes it, it's there's a, a randomness about where you start but there are things we can do to help people set a clearer course for themselves i think and it's better done not by standardizing but by personalizing our schools so ken thank you very much indeed my pleasure thank you great that was excellent all right